Good morning, and welcome to worship on this third Sunday after Pentecost. My name is Pastor Seth Novak, and on behalf of the entire congregation of Anus Day, I'd like to thank you for being a part of this worship service today. Our building may be closed, but the church is still open. You can download a worship bulletin with an order of service from the link in the video description below. Before we begin our worship today, I'd like to invite us to take just a moment to share prayer requests from the community. You may share your prayers of concern or gratitude that you may have in the chat or the comments, being mindful of privacy in this public space. Today we remember in prayer Julie B., who had her, surgery, her foot surgery this week. Um, all went very well. Uh, we pray for healing for Julie and also for Lauren, who is showing signs of improvement after his concussion. We continue to pray for Rose V., who has been in the hospital this past week. And uh, an update on a prayer request we received not too long ago from Katie Hay. She asked for prayers for her nephew Liam and his family after Liam was diagnosed with muscular dystrophy. Uh, Liam's younger brother Kellen has also been found to have the disease. And so uh, Katie asked for prayers for both boys and also their whole family as they ponder this, uh, process this news and ponder what this holds for them. You will also have the opportunity to include your prayers during the intercessory prayers before we celebrate Holy Communion. As part of our our intercessory prayers this summer, we'll be remembering different Mission Start ministries in our synod each week. Uh, We'll pray for a new ministry that each week that has begun within the last 13 years in our Southwest Washington Synod. Anya's Day also began as a Mission Start Synod or excuse me, Mission Start Congregation. And so we are glad to support our siblings in Christ through prayer, just as we ourselves have been supported. I invite you to turn now to your bulletin as we continue with our order of service. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, God of manna, God of miracles, God of mercy. Amen. Drawn to Christ and seeking God's abundance, Let us confess our sin. God, our provider, help us. It is hard to believe there is enough to share. We question your ways when they differ from the ways of the world in which we live. We turn to our understanding rather than trusting in you. We take offense at your teachings and your ways. Turn us again to you. Where else can we turn? Share with us the words of eternal life and feed us for the life of the world. Amen. Beloved people of God, in Jesus, the manna from heaven, you are fed and nourished. By Jesus, the worker of miracles, there is always more than enough. Through Jesus, the bread of life, you are shown God's mercy. You are forgiven and loved into abundant life. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. I'll invite you to please join me in our hymn.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, you are the tree of life, offering shelter to all the world. Graft us into yourself and nurture our growth, that we may bear your truth and love to those in need. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. A reading from Ezekiel. Thus says the Lord God, I myself will take a sprig from the lofty top of a cedar. I will set it out. I will break off a tender one from the topmost of its young twigs. I myself will plant it on a high and lofty mountain. On the mountain height of Israel, I will plant it in order that it may produce boughs and bear fruit and become a noble cedar. Under it, every kind of bird will live In the shade of its branches will nest winged creatures of every kind. All the trees of the field shall know that I am the Lord. I bring low the high tree and make high the low tree. I dry up the green tree and make the dry tree flourish. I, the Lord, have spoken. I will accomplish it. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. A reading from 2 Corinthians. So we are always confident, even though we know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we do have confidence, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please Him. For all of us must appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each may receive recompense for what has been done in the body, whether good or evil. For the love of Christ urges us on, because we are convinced that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, so that those who might live no longer for themselves, but for him who died and was raised for them. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view, Even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the fourth chapter. Jesus said, The kingdom of God is as if someone would scatter seed on the ground and would sleep and rise night and day, and the seed would sprout and grow. He does not know how. The earth produces of itself, first the stalk, then the head, then the full grain in the head. But when the grain is ripe, he at once goes in with a sickle, because the harvest has come. He also said, With what can we compare the kingdom of God? And to what shall we compare it? What parable shall we use for it? It is like a mustard seed, which when sown upon the ground is the smallest of all the seeds of the earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes the greatest of all shrubs and puts forth large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. With many such parables, he spoke to them as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them except in parables, but he explained everything in private to his disciples. The Gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. A few years ago, more than a few years ago now, Stephanie and I went to Granada in southern Spain. While we were there, we visited the Alhambra, the royal palace and fort complex that once housed the capital of the Moorish territory of Al-Andalus. In one of the palatial courtyards, there is a fountain, 
surrounded by 12 stone lions. The story goes that the fountain was built as a clock, that these ingenious Andalusian architects uh, designed it so that water would pour forth from the mouth of a different lion at each hour. When the Spaniards conquered Granada, they were amazed by this advanced engineering, and they took this fountain apart to see how it worked. After detailed investigation, they remained completely baffled. So they just put it back together just as they disassembled it. But it never worked again. Jesus' parables are frequently enigmatic, kind of like that fountain. They're simple stories, but stories that do complex work. The temptation is often to read these parables as allegories, uh, stories where one, every element uh, has a specific meaning, you know, fables meant to convey a moral point, a single moral point. We try to understand these parables by taking them apart, trying to figure out how they work uh, to get a better idea of their plumbing. But we may end up losing or missing what makes them really special. Parables are generally neither allegories nor fables. They don't have simple meanings or singular points that they're trying to make. They're more like divine jokes. Jokes play with our expectations and surprise us in order to entertain us. Like jokes, I think parables are often excuse me, intended to be entertaining, even funny. Jesus isn't talking to scholars or debating with lawyers here. He's talking with blue-collar people using language they would use with one another in their everyday conversations. It makes sense that in order to connect with them, he would use jokes and parables. When parables make us laugh, we consider them harmless, and we allow them past our defenses and our prejudices where they can present new ideas that we might not otherwise accept. But, of course, to explain a joke or a parable is to kill it, to suck the life out of it. You all know that telling someone why a joke is funny only makes it less funny. And yet, in order to get Jesus' joke, we have to understand it. That's why my job today is so ironic. The sermon is supposed to help us understand this parable, but if I explain it, I'm going to kill it. Isn't that funny? When Jesus originally told these stories to people, he used ideas and images that would have been very familiar to them. For example, when Jesus told these seed parables, he was speaking to a, fee, to a people very familiar with farming. Even if they themselves didn't farm, there were farmers all around. They were in the midst of farm fields and shepherds' fields. Um, they, live, they knew how to tell when grain was ripe, and they knew what happened when the grain was ripe. They knew that no one in their right mind would intentionally sow mustard anywhere because it grew wild everywhere, and anywhere it grew, it spread like, like wildfire. They also know that mustard does not, it, while it does grow very large, it could hardly be called the greatest of all shrubs. And it is certainly not a place in which birds build their nests. These twists are the punchline of the parable. But without understanding the way the parable plays with those expectations, the punchline just sails right over our heads. And that's why we hear a little bit of Ezekiel today. The reading comes from a much longer poem that is itself a parable of sorts. As Ezekiel tells uh, a story as a comment on the political situation of his own time. In this parable, he uses a well-established uh, image for God's kingdom, a cedar. Now, Pacific Northwesterners know a lot about cedars. They're tall, lovely trees with beautiful wood. Lebanon, just north of Israel, was renowned for its abundant, high-quality cedar forests. When King Solomon built his first temple, he constructed it using cedar lumber from Lebanon. Ezekiel, Daniel, Isaiah, and Zechariah all use tall, majestic cedar trees to represent the righteousness of God and God's chosen kingdom, Israel. 
especially in this parable of Ezekiel's, this image is repeated of a small shoot of cedar being taken and planted, eventually growing into a majestic tree, the way all plants grow. The growth is understood to be the work of God, as is the image of the birds taking refuge in its branches. All the way back in Genesis, God explains that God has chosen to set Abraham and his descendants aside to be a blessing to the world. A cedar blessed by God to grow tall and strong that blesses the birds of the air with its safety. So, okay, great, we get it. The cedar represents God's kingdom, right? Starts off small, grows into something big for the benefit of the whole world. Mustard does the same thing, right? That must be exactly the point. Well, not quite. See, when Jesus begins talking about God's kingdom like being a plant sprouting, his original Jewish audience may have began to think back to Ezekiel and to these other prophets and to expect him to talk about God's kingdom, Israel, as a noble cedar. Instead, Jesus says, God's kingdom is like the noble and mighty mustard weed. It starts out small, but it grows into the greatest of pernicious vegetables. When I say it that way, you can start to see the humor, right? Right? Jesus' language about the kingdom of God and the tallest of trees and the birds nesting in the branches cause us to expect a cedar. But instead, we're given the image of a common weed. It begins to make us wonder. I wonder, if the cedar is Israel, what's the mustard seed? Is it Israel or is it something else? If God's kingdom isn't Israel, then, well, then what is it? If the power of kingdoms is symbolized by the strength and the height of trees, is the kingdom of God even a kingdom at all? These are all questions that Jesus' parable might raise, questions that if he simply asked might make us defensive or confused. But wrapped in this little parable, this little joke about a weed, they just entertain us. And then they cause us to ask what might otherwise be very dangerous questions. So now I've ruined the joke for you. You're welcome. We can take it apart like the lion fountain and analyze it until we're blue in the face and we'll only get less funny. But maybe with some appreciation of the background, we can still learn something from it. Of course, it's not just the past that helps us understand the joke, but also the future. The best part of this divine joke is not the punchline, but who's telling it? When Ezekiel originally told his story, the noble cedar represented the royal lineage of David. The tender shoot plucked from the top was the current king. Earlier in the chapter, Ezekiel describes how the cedar shoot is plucked by an eagle, representing the king of Babylon, and then taken into exile. But in the story we read today, God takes the tippy-top cedar shoot and plants it on Mount Zion, In Jerusalem, Ezekiel uses the image as a promise of restoration for Israel and that through restoration, God's blessings are poured out on the whole world. Well, as we know, Jesus is David's royal heir, God's promised Messiah. He's, in a sense, the very restoration that Ezekiel imagined half a millennium earlier. But just like that surprising mustard bush in this parable, He's not what people expected. The noble cedars of his time saw him as the invasive weed in God's perfectly ordered garden. They planted him on a hill, all right, didn't they? He sprouted from the ground and put forth his branches, but not at all in the way Ezekiel imagined. But you know what? In spite of that, in spite of the fact that none of this happened the way that it was supposed to, In his death, God's blessing was spread to the whole world. Funny how that works, isn't it? Under his outstretched arms, we come to find life and safety. The people who were waiting for a cedar found a mustard bush, so they cut it down. Now, when you cut down a cedar, that's it, right? No more cedar. But do you know what happens when you pull out a mustard bush? Some years ago, the folks from a local congregation in Pullman, Washington, decided to plant some mustard in the community garden 
uh, in honor of this uh, parable. They selected a corner apart from the other herbs and vegetables to plant their mustard seeds, not even knowing if they would sprout. Well, sprout they did, and they did indeed grow into grand little shrubs. And then they kept growing. The gardeners spent all summer fighting and wrestling with this mustard to keep it from spreading beyond its allotted corner. It was with great relief that that fall they finally pulled up all the old plants and tilled the entire garden under to be ready for the next year. But then next spring, before they had a chance to plant any new crops, before the snow was scarcely off the ground, do you know what they found? The entire garden plot was nothing but mustard. (laughs) That's the joke, I think. Cedars are tall and noble, but they can be cut down. Mustard is nothing special. It's like scotch broom or blackberry brambles or shotweed, which I learned recently, by the way, is actually a type of mustard. You can eat the leaves just like you can mustard greens. I've not tried grinding up the seeds and mixing with vinegar, but... Anyway, once it shows up, it's there to stay. If God's kingdom, if in God's kingdom, death only encourages new life, what does that say to us when we encounter death and suffering in our own lives? If Jesus is the nasty weed in the well-ordered garden, what does that say about the people we'd like to uproot from our own community? If the noble cedars in charge of our country and our economy are not what God's kingdom looks like, then where do we look to see God at work? We may not be able to explain Jesus' little joke about seeds, but we don't really have to. They take root and grow in us. We know not how. They keep creeping into our vacant lots and our highway medians. Every time we see shotweed or scotch broom or blackberries, we can think about God's kingdom and be reminded of the ways it's always there, sometimes unnoticed, until all of a sudden we realize that everything else has been pushed out to make way for God's gentle reign of justice and peace, even when it looks like exactly the contrary. And in that reign of justice and peace, There will be plenty of spicy mustard and blackberry jam for everyone. (laughs) And when that harvest comes, we'll know to grab our sickles and get to work.
Today we celebrate those who are approaching their transition from one phase of their faith journeys to the next. We wish to honor them and to show them that we, their community of faith, stand with them and support them as fellow believers in Jesus Christ. Even though we can't do this in person because of COVID, we want to make sure that we get a chance to do it. So at this time, I'll invite uh, our graduates to just share a who they are and a little bit about themselves. All right. Um, I'm Benjamin Nussbaum. I'm graduating from Gig Harbor High School, and I'm planning on going to PLU to study Hello. computer hardware. Hello. I'm Alexis Nussbaum. I am also graduating from Gig Harbor High School and going to PLU, but I'm going to study uh, early childhood education. I am Jamie Baxter, and I'm graduating from Peninsula High School, and I'm going to Central Washington University to study history and education. All right. Cool. Thank you. Parents. In Christian love, you presented your children for holy baptism. At their baptism, sacred promises were made. <clears throat> As parents of these young men and women, it was part of your calling to see that those sacred promises were kept, to faithfully bring them to the services of God's house, to teach them the Lord's Prayer, the Creed, and the Ten Commandments, to place in their hands the Holy Scriptures, and to provide for their instruction in the Christian faith. You have fulfilled these promises. We now ask you to covenant with this congregation for the ongoing su support of these young women's and men's faith journeys. Do you intend to routinely lift your children up in prayer? So please respond, I do, and I ask God to help me. I do, I do, and I ask God to help me. Congregation, even though we can't hear you, oh, Pam, you can uh, chime in on behalf of the congregation here. <clears throat> Uh, do you promise to support and encourage these families in, keeping of the, in the keeping of these sacred promises to help these young women and men as, they, as the need and opportunity arises? If so, please respond. We do, and we ask God to help us. We do, and we ask God to help us. Graduates, you have participated in the worship, fellowship, education, and service programs of this congregation. As you move ahead in this new step of life's journey, we ask you, will you continue to keep the promises made at your confirmation, to live among God's faithful people, to hear the word of God and share in the Lord's Supper, to proclaim the good news of, Christ, of God in Christ, to serve all people following the example of Jesus, and to strive for peace and justice in all the earth? If so, please respond, I do, and I ask God to help me. God to help me. On this important day, we are eager to show you how delighted we are that you have reached this milestone. As fellow members of this congregation, we rejoice with you, and we want you to know of our pride and excitement as you move from this accomplishment uh, into the, stage of, the next stage of your lives. Today, we bless you so that you may know that wherever you go and whatever you do, you are going forward with the prayers and the support of this congregation for God's continued guidance, power, protection, and strength. As a sign of that blessing, I'll invite uh, Pam Martin to come forward and present our shawls, your shawls. <laughs> These were made by the... Different members. Am I supposed to do something different? No, you're fine. Different members of the, of the mini group that we do here, we usually make prayer shawls, but for our graduating seniors, we make afghans. And so, those of you who are going to PLU, there are two that are similar. So this is, this is for you. Thank you. Colors, this is for color request. And it was made by three different people. 
So it's a group effort, and I just want you to love and enjoy it. And remember always that where you came from, where you're going, and the beach. You're always welcome back. <laughs> <laughs> well said, Pam. Thank you. Um, parents, I'll invite you if you want to come and uh, place a hand on your graduate's shoulder. <clears throat> if you want to step forward and give them a little bit of room to do that, that'd be helpful. Ooh. All right. Let us pray. Well, Lord Jesus Christ, when you welcomed the children, your invitation included each one of us. Your guiding hand has continually been upon these young women and men. You have sustained them. You have shared in their laughter and wiped away their tears. In times of confusion, you have offered direction. In times of sorrow, you have offered hope. In times of doubt, your Holy Spirit has lifted them up. Grant, O Savior, that each of these graduates may have the warmth of your continued presence as they go forward into the future. Guide their steps Hold them in the palm of your hand. Bless them and keep them now and forever. Amen. Amen. Wherever you wander, no matter how dark the night, may the love of your family, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the community of this church, the power of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Go with God's blessing. All right. Thank you. Let us come before the triune God in prayer. Holy God, you plant the seeds of faith in every nation. Enliven your church so that the good news of your grace may root and grow throughout the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Creator, even the trees, shrubs, and flowers delight in your goodness. From the depths of the soil to the highest mountains, bring forth new plants. Restore growth to places suffering drought. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Judge of nations, we pray for our leaders and those in power. Grant them the ability to regard those under their charge with humility, dedicating their lives in service to others. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Divine Comforter, you show compassion to those in need and provide relief to those who call on you. Bless all who suffer, especially people trapped in cycles of poverty and homelessness. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Sovereign God, this place of worship belongs to you. We give thanks and pray for our church musicians. We dedicate to you the joyful noise that comes from this place, the cries of children, the melody of voices and instruments, and the songs from our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, we give thanks for all our recent graduates, Jamie, Alexis, Ben, Keeley, and Kean. Guide them in their path forward. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of new beginnings, we pray for the mission start ministries in our synod. This week, we pray especially for the Light of Grace Korean Ministry of Federal Way and Pastor Sang Soo Kim and Jenny Kim. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For what and for whom do the people pray? Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Eternal God, we give thanks for our ancestors in the faith who are now at home with you. We look forward to that day when we are united in your new creation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We lift our prayers to you, O God, trusting in your abiding grace. Amen. Distant spring to 
Let us pray. Jesus, bread of life, you have set this table with your very self and called us to the feast of plenty. Gather what has been sown among us and strengthen us in this meal. Make us to be what we receive here, your body for the life of the world. Amen. As we prepare our hearts and our homes to receive the Lord's Supper, let us pray. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, we give you thanks for your life-sustaining love with which you have always guided us. When the flood came, you provided an ark. When the plagues came, you provided refuge. When the evening came, you provided a pillar of fire. When the exile came, you provided a new song. Day after day after day, your love has remained steadfast day after day after day. In your boundless love, you provided for us a Savior, Jesus Christ, who healed the sick, gave strength to the weak, restored hope to the desolate, and proclaimed the good news of your coming reign of peace and justice. Day after day after day, he laid down his life for us. Day after day after day. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks and broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. When he'd given thanks, he gave it for all to drink saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. As often as we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Come, beloved Christ, in the midst of our fear, in the midst of our anxiety, in the midst of our longing, in the midst of our impatience, heal us, strengthen us, give us hope. Day after day after day, let us proclaim and hear good news. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Holy Spirit, with this bread and cup, the body and blood of Christ, unite us with all who gather at this table, across space and time, across social distance and social divides, across party lines and national borders. Filled with the breath of God and fed with the body of Christ, day after day after day, raise us to new life in you. Amen. 
Come, Holy Spirit. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, we praise your name with all our life and breath and strength, together with all your creatures, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, but deliver us from the evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. If you are not receiving the meal today, receive this blessing. May the love of Jesus fulfill and sustain you this day and every day. Amen. If you are receiving the meal this morning, then hear these words of promise. This is the body of Christ given for you. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in life that is abundant and eternal. Amen. Let us pray. Jesus, bread of life, we have received from your table more than we could ever ask. As you nourish us in this meal, now strengthen us to love the world with your own life. In your name we pray. Amen. May the God who has brought us from death to life fill you with great joy. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. Before we conclude today, I'd like to just uh, share a few announcements. First, on Saturday, June 19th, Gig Harbor is celebrating Juneteenth, the holiday commemorating when the the last enslaved people in the U.S. were finally freed in 1865, a full two and a half years after the Emancipation Proclamation. To celebrate the Gig Harbor uh, Coalition for Racial Justice is hosting a virtual unity gathering via Zoom that morning at 10 a.m. with special guest speaker Aaron Jones. Anyone who wishes to participate is asked to please register in advance, um, and the link to that registration can be found on our website on the Racial Justice Vigil page uh, in the events section. As part of that uh, community-wide celebration, on you stay, we'll be moving our own normal Saturday vigil for racial justice to Edinburgh Park on Harborview that day. 
Everyone is invited to join the vigil in observance of the holiday. We'll meet at the church parking lot at 1145 and carpool downtown, and the vigil then will start at noon. Afterwards, uh, we'll come back up here to the church building where there will be a barbecue for anybody who's participated in any vigils along the way, or anybody who wants to show up. Bring your own burgers and sausages to grill, uh, excuse me, burgers or sausages to grill, and if you'd like, you can also bring a side to share, and the church will provide buns and condiments. That next day, Sunday, June 20th, is the deadline for Anya's Day's hybrid VBS program, uh, Backyard Safari, for that registration. The program will include six sessions for at-home use, grab-and-go style uh, VBS, beginning July 7th, followed by a one-day in-person event in early August. You can register from the Vacation Bible School event page on our website. June 20th is also the day that we will sadly be saying goodbye uh, to Aaron and Diana Edelblut, who are, are moving back east uh, to, be, to take a job closer to family. Um, the pandemic makes these leave takings uh, especially hard, um, but we will have the chance to wish them farewell and Godspeed at the end of our worship service on the 20th. So I hope you will be able to be here for that. Then the next week, we have a more joyous celebration. Uh, on the 27th, we'll be... Uh, Jocelyn Nussbaum will be affirming her baptism during worship. Um, Josie has a really great faith story that I hope she'll be able to share with you that day. And uh, I hope that you will able, also be able to be here to share that with her and her family. Finally, as we look forward to uh, beginning our hybrid worship beginning on July 25th, we are seeking volunteers to help with that worship Many of you have already uh, indicated a willingness to help as an usher or with the altar guild or to help with the streaming uh, when we are with the in-person aspect of ministry in the building. Um, but I also want to extend the invitation to those of us who will be continuing to join from online, um, that you also are welcome and encouraged to participate in the worship service uh, by being a uh, reading the lessons or helping lead the liturgy as an assisting minister. Um, we've continued to do that as we've been online, and it's worked out really well, and um, I'm looking forward to integrating that into our uh, in-person, our hybrid worship as well. One thing that COVID has taught us is that we don't need to be in the building to worship or to be a part of the ministry of this place, and so um, I hope that you will consider uh, continuing to contribute your um, your parts to this ministry, whether or not you've ever done so before. Maybe this is a perfect opportunity for you um, because you've never been able to before because of a work schedule or because you live too far away or uh, transportation issues. This could be your opportunity to uh, take part in this worship service in a new way. So I hope that you will consider that. If you are interested in learning more or would like to volunteer, uh, please email the church office at office at onyoustaylutheran.org or you can contact us via the uh, church webpage or our Facebook page. Thank you for being a part of this community. I'm really excited to see how this community uh, grows and changes as we morph uh, from totally online worship to a hybrid worship experience um, and to see what next thing, what new thing God has in store for us. Um, if you found today's service meaningful, please be sure to like this video and subscribe to our channel, where Anu's Day gathers for worship every Sunday at 9.45 a.m. And be sure to find us on the web at anustaylutheran.org. There you can find links to all the events that I've talked about and many others uh, that are happening both online and in person. Uh, things like Bible studies and service groups and many other ministries. Go in peace. You are the body of Christ. Thanks be to God. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all.
Thank you.